hey everybody it's sean gibbons from the communications network nice to see you all thank you for joining us on a tuesday in may uh we're gonna kick things off the way we always do uh, so if you've been with us before this will be familiar if not here's how it works we start with this thing called the two word check and you're seeing the slide right here if you would wait just a quick minute but you're going to go into the chat you should see that down on your screen we've all lived a zoom live you know that it's a little bubble right there you're going to click that open you're going to make sure you're talking to everyone or it might say all panelists and attendees but you're going to type in your name location where you're at not just where you're working but specifically where you're located at the moment and then in two words you can use five if you need to two is easier how are you what how are you feeling today uh so let's go ahead and just say hello to one another if you would, I'll go ahead and try to model us for everybody. Uh, someone's already beat me to it. Hey, it's Sean. As you can see, I can't type. Happy and curious. Uh, if I can spell in DC. And hey, Jasmine, Emily, how are you? Nicole, how are you, my friend? Jennifer down in Atlanta. Warming up for y'all, I think. Nicole in so foggy, I was going to say soggy San Francisco, foggy San Francisco, tired but inspired, right on. Janet up in Seattle. Y'all are about to fix and to get some of that good weather, I'm thinking. Will, how are you? Hobie, Deanna, how are you? Francesca, who else we got cooking with us? A whole bunch of other folks. Zoe, how are you? Sodia, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Marcella, nice to see you. Kat, how are you? Dory, Kristen, Sunny, Laura, Maggie, Tracy, Nora. Uh, Lucas, Alex, Sam, Fernanda, Max, Jill, uh, Prachi, how are you? Jen, all right, folks, keep on, uh, if you see folks you know, as you know, there's a DM function here, say hello to each other. Um, we'll be in this chat uh, over the next little while to share some links, so keep an eye on that as we get underway. Uh, with that, my partner in crime, Kareem Alston, is going to go ahead and slide on over. A couple little pieces of business we're going to tell you about, and then we're going to get on and hand things over to Melissa for part two of what I hope you're here for, which is a conversation about climate change communications, whether your organization is doing it, you live in the world, it's something we all need to be thinking about, and it's going to be a real practical, tactical conversation today. Uh, first thing I need to tell you about, though, here is something that, again, if you're a network member, chances are you know this. If you're thinking about membership, this might be the thing that, that prompts you to do it. We launched a Slack for network members back in February. So I guess we're, don't make me do the math because I'm a comms person. We're like four, three, four months into this now. Uh, and we've been overwhelmed by the responses. You can kind of see just from the GIF here, there are literally thousands of people chit-chatting with one another, sharing information, asking questions, helping each other out, kind of what the network's all about. Uh, but you can do that online 24 seven. I'm thinking pretty much all year long. Maybe we take a couple of days off here and there, but suffice to say, uh, that is available to you, and we encourage you. If you are a member, make sure you're getting signed up for that. We can help you if you need. And if you're not a member, this, again, might be the thing that makes you uh, think this is really worth my time and effort. All right, moving along from Slack, you can explore that more on your own. Uh, we're going to tell you about Circles. Again, I'll do this super briefly because you can find out more if you just hit that website right there, comnetworkcircles.org. But the idea here was the network now has 3,000 members around the globe, mostly here in the U.S., but increasingly around the globe, and trying to find a person who can be most helpful to you can sometimes feel like a needle in a haystack. That's what Circles is all about. Shrinking the group from 3,000 to a more manageable size, helping you build kind of those kitchen cabinets for folks who are going to be most helpful and useful to you and you to them. And we do that by organizing ourselves around maybe a shared identity, could be a job that you do, the, the role that you play inside of your organization, or it might be the issues that you're working on. We're going to be expanding these things over the next year or two. So we're real excited about this. But if you're a network member, you're eligible to participate in this. We'd welcome you to do so. This is also something they meet monthly on Zoom. And then they also chit chat across uh across the month uh, and across the year through Slack to help each other out. All right, moving right along. You can learn more again through that link. Uh, Com Network Local, I'll try to be brief about this. The map tells you everything. There are local groups uh, representing network members who are building community in the places where they live and work. Why? Well, frankly, sometimes you just need to borrow a cup of sugar. Chances are you're not going from up there in Seattle, if you see that little dot up there, down to Miami to do that. That's what Slack's for. But if you actually have a question about your local community or you're trying to collaborate with some folks, getting together with other folks working in comms for good where you live in your backyard is probably a good idea. And that's what locals are all about, building community. All right, with that, let's move along. One more here. I think uh, a couple of locals coming up. So I actually think I have three of these. New York, uh, in just a couple of days, going to have a happy hour. All these smiling faces, maybe they're familiar to you if you're in the New York area. They're going to be hosting a fantastic happy hour. Encourage you to get out. Uh, I was just up in New York with the board and the team last week, and the city's coming back to life in a big way. And this might be a nice way to re-enter our community if you haven't had the chance. So check that out. You'll learn more on comnetwork.org. And Kareem was kind enough just to put the link in there for you all the folks who are local. Uh, opposite side of the country another time zone. 
Portland, Oregon. Again, see all these lovely faces, happy faces. These are friends of ours and hopefully friends of yours. And they're going to be gathering up, also doing a happy hour. Other side of the country, uh, maybe there'll be some bragging rights about who has the better IPAs. I don't know. But suffice to say, let's go. I think we got one more uh, to share with you for folks, and that's our friends in Denver. So not quite the middle, I guess, shading a little bit towards the west, but they're going to be getting together. Also a social kind of thing, and that's going to be happening on June the 8th. Uh, and so real excited for that. Again, information in the link if you should need it. And I should say this, locals, open to everybody. So network members are our leaders, but uh, everybody in the community who works in comms for good is, of course, welcome because uh, we're all about trying to help fix folks get connected to one another. All right. So with that, I think I am done with my chores. Uh, oh, no, one more, one more, June the 7th. And maybe you saw this in the little reminder we sent out yesterday, our friend Chuck Babington, former White House correspondent for the Associated Press in the Washington Post, now makes his living uh, teaching all the rest of us how to become really good writers. Uh, and so he's been with us before, he's been with us at ComNet, he's going to be back with us June the 7th, we have a link in there for you, or we will in a moment, for y'all to RSVP, if you'd like to join us, then he's fantastic, and we're happy to do that for you. All right, with that, I think I get to stop except to say maybe thank you to Marva, uh, who is offering ASL services to us, as she often does. And so we're grateful for that. If you have need for uh, closed captioning, you'll also see you have the option of doing that. Chances are you figured this out in the Zoom world we live in. It's that CC thing down at the bottom. And because everyone asks, I'm going to go ahead and try to get in front of it. Yes, we are recording this. We will post it on the network's YouTube channel, which you can avail yourself of through comnetwork.org. Just search, search for us on uh, on YouTube. And we'll be posting that as quick as we can. Chances are it's going to be, give us a couple hours, maybe by tomorrow. Uh, and then the last thing maybe just to tell you is back end of this webinar, we're going to do this thing we've been doing for a little while now, office hours. So what that means is when Melissa is done, we're all going to, and we'll send you a link to do this, we're all going to go over to another webinar thing where we can actually see and talk to one another and have a chat. And you'll be able to ask questions directly of Melissa there. So invite you to make some time for that if your schedule allows. All right. I yacked at you a lot. Let me shut up here and hand it over to our good friend, Melissa Ronzik. You can see her bona fides right there. She's taking over the slides right now. Uh, but she has been kind enough to come back and talk to us a little bit more about communicating about climate change. And she spends her time thinking about nothing but as she uh, works as a researcher and teacher professor at uh, Rutgers University over there in New Jersey. With that, Melissa, my friend, I will shut up. I'll see you all on the other side. Why don't you go ahead and take it away? Hi, everyone. Uh, great to see you all. Thank you so much for taking your lunch hour or early coffee hour or afternoon break hour, wherever you are, uh, to take part in this webinar. Um, I'm really happy to be here with all of you and uh, hope over the next um, 30 to 45 minutes, I'm going to talk about how climate change can and should be part of your mandate. Even if it isn't officially part of your written mandate, it's not something that your organization focuses on. At this stage, um, my position is that it can and must show up in your work. What gets attention? What helps people think differently about climate action? And what do you as climate professionals have within your remit? So let me just give you a bit of a roadmap for what we're gonna do today. Um, I'm gonna start with a recap from uh, the ComNet webinar that I gave back in February. Um, that was sort of part one and today is part two. It doesn't matter if you didn't see part one, but there is a recording of it available if you wanna check it out after this session. Um, uh, I think that we're gonna put a link to that in the chat just so you have access to it. So I'm going to do a bit of a recap on what I call communication realities and communication proposals for climate action. What I'm going to do next is then talk us through four steps for climate action. There's a little bit of do's and don'ts in there, but mainly it's about generating ideas, ideas that are modular so that you can adapt them to your organization's realities. Number one is about how to move away from habits that you don't want and how to think about habits that uh, you do want and that are more suited to the climate era in which we're now communicating. Number two is about thinking about your brand as a climate brand and communicating those changes. Number three is about always maintaining the strength of the trust in the ties you have with your stakeholders. And number four is about finding time to inject some sources of inspiration. 
Uh, I'm going to carry a couple of those uh, sources of inspiration into my conclusion, offer a takeaway or two, and then uh, we'll open everything up for discussion and Q&A. And uh, as Sean said, at the very end, after that, I'll have another half hour of office hours. It's sort of quieter, uh, more intimate environment. If you want to ask some questions directly, we can we can do that too. All right. So moving right along, as I said, I'm going to do now a recap of the ComNet session that I ran uh, back in February. Hopefully those of you who've heard it before, it won't be uh, you know too boring for you. Um, hopefully it'll be a nice refresher and a real lead in to what I wanna talk about next. So I started out last time by talking about what I call communication realities. And what do I mean by communication realities? I'm basically talking about the baseline platforms from which we all communicate about the issues that our audiences care about. And the baseline platform that we have today is that we're all living and working on a planet that's going through unprecedented change. And that has some pretty major implications for how we do our jobs as communicators. So when I say climate change affects everything, I want us to think about how all problems are now climate-related problems. Climate change is here, it's now, it's not coming for us anymore, it's, it's right here, and it's directly impacting every aspect of our lives. And when I think about all of you as nonprofit communicators, as solutions-focused professionals, and as really leaders in your organization when it comes to empowering your audiences and your communities to take care of themselves, their health, their well-being, and to connect their health and well-being to the choices that they make in their lives, I do think of all of you as climate communicators. And so that leads me to my second proposition, which is that if since we're all climate communicators, we all, all of us, but really everyone else too, needs to talk about climate change. Now, point two seems like it kind of gets offset or very complicated by the complexities of, of climate change. Number three, climate change, as important as it is, as urgent as it is, is very hard to talk about. So one of the things we're tasked with doing as communications professionals is to normalize the conversation around climate change and to help our communi communities make sense of climate change in their lived experience. But we have to acknowledge, you know, and this is the hard part, we're currently doing this in a very polarized political environment a very fragmented and emotions driven media environment so you know we we can't pretend that that isn't the case that is the case and we also have to acknowledge that particular features of the climate crisis are not features that we have encountered before although i will say after now that we're hopefully emerging from the covid situation we have now adopted and adapted to to some of those realities what I mean to say by this is, you know, climate change is overwhelming for a lot of us. Um, it has major implications, not only for how we live, but also it really has to do with how all of us live everywhere on the planet. Every action is connected to other people. So what I want to talk about today is how we can turn that into an advantage for us rather than a potential liability. So again, just continuing on what I uh, brought up at my last uh, ComNet session back in February, to respond to those communication realities, I offer three communication proposals. The first one is um, my, my colleague told me after, you know, this is a very academic thing to say, is to develop a climate imaginary. Um, but here's, here's what I mean by this, and here's what some of us uh, scholars are talking about when we say climate imaginary. I think we've reached a moment where a completely new image of the earth is needed, a completely new vision. We need a new vantage point from which to see the earth, the planet, and our relationship to it. If you imagine in your mind what climate change conjures up as an image, it's probably not a very positive image. It's probably an image we can imagine drought or floods, you know, these kinds of extreme images that we see online. And if you search climate change online, that's what you're gonna find. But what kind of new images can we create that are more compelling, that tell better stories 
about responding to climate change rather than these kinds of devastating or drastic images that lead to that feeling of overwhelm that I mentioned a moment ago. Climate change also has to be something that's like a touchstone for us at all times because we can no longer think of it as something that we only encounter once a year in a heat wave or once a year when we go to a national park. It has to be, like I said at the beginning, our baseline condition. How do we do that? How do we develop a climate imaginary? Well, there are a lot, of, I'm gonna talk about some of those ideas today. One thing I like to really um, press on, and again, that might seem a little counterintuitive, is to focus on actions and not solutions per se. What do I mean by that? Well, it has to do with how we think about climate change. Because climate change is so complex, because it carries so many interlocking parts, it affects each of us quite differently in our lives. And sometimes trying to convey that climate change is one problem with one solution or that you know one kind of issue with one particular solution, it's just not gonna speak to as many people as you want and need it to speak to. Um, when we talk about solutions often also, and I'll get into this in a moment, sometimes it means that we're defining what the problem is for people, but we don't always know what that problem is. So we wanna keep our, Climate imaginary, very open-ended, very flexible when we're thinking about modeling actions. All actions are good actions, not all solutions are the best solutions, as I'll show you uh, in today's presentation. Um, and then finally, of course, promoting shared resolve. Here, the climate imaginary really comes to the fore. This is about projecting an image, projecting a brand, communicating in such a way that shows that indeed we are all in this together. And we, yes, we are facing something unprecedented, but yes, we also have the tools, we have the intelligence and the innovative spirit, and we have the communities to draw together and to push forward on climate action. So I wanna talk about that um, really in more detail now when I get into today's real substance, which is these four steps toward climate action. And I hope you find them inspiring and encouraging. And you know, I really look forward to our conversation in the Q&A uh, and to see you know, how these ideas are resonating with you. Let's talk about the first one now. The first idea I wanna share, as you can see here, it's about habits. It has to do with habits, but it also has to do especially with changing habits. So this first step is called stop doing what you're doing. Now, we are emerging, uh, as we all well know, from a state of COVID emergency, that real sense of emergency that was firing us up for the last number of years. And from that emergency comes a new urgency, an urgency to rebuild, uh, to rebuild community, to rebuild what we stand for. I think we've accepted that we're not, we don't want to go back to the way things were, even if we thought we could. We want to move forward. Um, and we want a new a new image. One of the hardest things about changing our image, changing the way we communicate uh, or how we think, is that disrupts habits. And habits, whether good or bad, give us a sense of security and a sense of confidence. And that makes them very hard to change. We can, however, draw from the science of habits to learn how to break old and tired work behaviors and engage in new and productive habits that include climate commitments. Now, one thing we actually learned from the science of habits, just to encourage us a little bit, is that old habits are very hard to break except in moments of rupture and change. So actually, we find ourselves right now in the perfect moment to start thinking about new habits uh, and how to connect them to climate commitments. I wanna show you something now that this might be familiar to you. Um, it's taken from uh, Charles Duhigg who has a really great book called The Power of Habit. It came, about, came out about 10 years ago now, it's not new. And uh, if you go to his website, you can get all the details and so on. And by the way, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a promoter for Charles Duhigg. I just find some of these ideas interesting and, and uh, very easy to um, present and, and help us think through. Now, Duhigg points out that habits essentially have three components that you see here on the screen. The cue, the routine or the habit, and the reward. The cue is what triggers you to do something. The habit is, or the routine, is the action or, the, or behavior that's triggered by the cue. 
And the reward is the feeling or outcome that you receive that reinforces that habit. Now, so the first thing to do when we're thinking practically about how to change habits is to identify these three components in the habits of your organization. Think of it like a habit audit for climate impact. What routines do you have that result in a negative climate impact or a negligible climate impact? And what could they look like to have a positive impact on climate protection? So if we walk through, you know, if you're thinking about some of the habits in your own organization right now, just as a little thought experiment, or if you're taking notes, the process you would go through would look like this. You would identify the cue. Is it something atmospheric, like a particular season or an event in the calendar that prompts the habit? Is it a special request from your client that always comes annually or, or seasonally? Number two, can you observe the routine or the habit? What does that cue trigger and what does that look like? You want to really articulate what that habit is. Um, when Sean and I were speaking, uh, preparing for this talk, he shared with me the habit his organization had of preparing hard copies of reports like books for his board meetings. You know, is there a way to consume less paper? Is there a way to produce another style of book um, that is actually more impactful on audiences than continuing to do something the way you always have because the expectation has been set up. Three is to analyze the reward. And this is also really important because this is the part you're gonna to wanna to focus on when you're changing the habit. Is the reward, for example, a positive reputation? You know, maybe your audience or your stakeholders feel like they can count on you when you do this thing, right? That you're a reliable provider. So now you know that you still want that reward, right? You still want to be trusted, of course. You still want to be seen as a reliable go-to provider or communicator. So what other kind of habits can you develop that maintain the reward, but shift the habit to being more conscious of this climate era that we find ourselves in? So that's the habit audit. It's really about sorting through what habits you have that you want, what habits you have that you don't want, um, and which ones need to be renewed or renovated. All right, I'm gonna move on to step two. I hopefully, uh, I'm not going too fast here, but again, we'll have some time to chat about this at the end. Step two toward climate action is about how you as communicators take a leadership role in this habit audit and transformation. When you identify worn out habits and when you implement new ones, your task is to lead both internally with your organization's team and externally with all of your stakeholders by showing us the how and the why of these habits in a climate context. If you attended my, my February session, you know, I'm gonna create FOMO here by referring constantly back to my February session. But if you attended it, you know that I shared this slide and asked this question of whether climate change itself has a branding problem. For the reason I, I mentioned, you know, you imagine it as something bad. You imagine it as something devastating or overwhelming. Now, if part of the problem that we're trying to address with renewing our habits is that it's hard to talk about climate change and you're trying to make it easier, then when you implement new climate action habits, you're also making it easier to talk about climate change. So what you're actually doing is building the brand of climate action. You're building a brand for the planet, for a positive vision of climate change through the actions of your organization. And so in doing so, you're doing, you're kind of achieving a double mission, right? You're building the strength and positive force of your brand as you're building the strength and positive force of what it means to be involved in climate action. So one key to leading the change or leading the charge, I should say, on implementing new climate friendly actions at your organization is to develop the communications principles that go along with those climate friendly habits. You want to lead on creating this communications framework internally so that your team is already very aware of the how and the why of these new habits, 
they're easy, you know, or straightforward to implement, often ideally easier than what they were doing before, and that your team can see the clear benefits for themselves. This is really key, and it will help you avoid that sense that you're talking about climate action but not really doing it. Of course, there has to be a benefit for your organization, but not just for external stakeholders. The benefit also has to redound to your team in order for it to be taken up. I'm sure that, you know, these are communications principles I'm sure you're already practicing at your organization. So now the question is just how to bring the climate dimension into that those existing frameworks. Um, here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to show a few examples to just kind of, you know, make a little bit more concrete what I've been talking about. And I just want to preface those examples by saying, once again, I, I have no direct connections to the organizations I'm going to talk about. I'm not advocating for them. You know, there's no secret PR mission going on here. Um, I just, you know, in the course of my research, I've come across some initiatives that I know a little bit about and um, I find them interesting or unusual or, or innovative. And so I'm, I'm going to bring them to you here. Uh, and I hope throughout, through doing this, I can demonstrate for you how um, habit changes can take place in a really positive way, like we've been discussing. So here's the first one. Um, skip the stuff. So hashtag skip the stuff is created by a nonprofit organization called Upstream. Upstream is devoted to providing information and toolkits to help your organization shift from using single use products like um, plastic bottles for water to reuse, reusable products in ways that have been shown by this organization uh, and by a lot of research on the topic to cut costs, build community, and minimize waste in the process. Um, you know, if you're interested in looking into Upstream, um, again, no, I am not promoting Upstream, but if you're interested, uh, you can see they have an app, and the app is, is kind of interesting because it lets you compare costs between single-use and reusable products, so that can help you justify um, purchasing reusable products when you're um, involved in your inventory or when you're planning an event. Um, and it will also help you, this app will also help you source reusable goods, which, you know, sometimes you don't know off the top of your head where to find them. Um, you know, these are a few of the other approaches and campaigns that Upstream conducts. So just to give you kind of a sense of uh, the kinds of work they've done in different communities or the kinds of toolkits that they've provided. And, you know, the fact is, you don't really even need Upstream to create this new habit or one like it. I mean, you really don't. The rewards are very clear. Right. There's there's it's kind of a win win situation all around. And this is a very, very easy process and an easy message to show the value to your internal audiences and to your external audiences. So here again, I want to stress part of the effectiveness of a very straightforward you know, campaign or project or commitment like this is that it's easy to do this. Um, many of us, uh, you know, I'll, I'll speak for myself, I won't speak for everyone else here, but I am somewhat obsessed now about not buying plastic bottles of water at the bodega or the, the corner store. I just, there, there's really no value to it. There's no value. Often, in many cases, if you're buying Dasani or other kinds of water, it's not even spring water, it's recycled water. It's probably less good for you than what you're getting out of the tap. If you use it a second time, microplastics can seep into your system. I mean, there's just really no need in this day and age to buy single-use plastic water bottles for anything. So um, I want to I want to promote that idea more than I want to promote what this specific organization is doing. Here's another example. This one is uh, obviously directly from uh, my own experience. Um, but it's not by me. Um, it's by a colleague, and I, I just used an, a pseudonym here because um, I just didn't want to. Um, reveal his colleague's name unless uh, they really wanted me to. But this is a syllabus rider you see here, the sustainability policy. Uh, this is from my colleague, and uh, she teaches environmental journalism um, at a prominent university down south um, in a state that is not really so environmentally friendly right now. Um, but she, you know, she teaches environmental journalism. She's training the next generation of reporters and writers to think about climate action. And so for her, it's just natural that supporting your thinking about those topics means not having plastic bottles. Um, 
you know, she acknowledges that some people like those, you know, Starbucks plastic, you know, durable containers that they use over and over again. All right. So, okay, she'll concede that one. But she's also not going to use any paper in that course. And, you know, while she's not against uh, people buying books, why not a used book to read? A lot of the texts that we can get these days are so easy to find used. Again, they're cheaper. Um, it's just a, just a great idea all around. Again, such an easy use case. Um, one other example I'll give you before I move on to the next step. Uh, this was a really interesting example from, again, my experience. Uh, I was invited uh, about a month ago to the University of Florida to give a talk on my research, my primary area of research, which is the role of public relations on climate communication. Now, before the event, this group that you see on the screen, We Are Neutral, contacted the University of Florida uh, and asked if they could offset um, my talk, offset the, the conference event that I was speaking at. And at first, the organizers who are very into climate action were totally uninterested um, because as some of you are maybe well aware, it's really not clear that carbon offsetting has any impact on climate action. Um, in fact, it can sometimes have the opposite effect. But then they realized, and we talked about it, and we thought, you know, there's a real opportunity here to have a conversation about exactly that topic. Why don't we use this as a learning opportunity for us, for the panelists, and for the audience? Let's talk about carbon offsetting. Let's let this group come. Sure, they can claim to offset the conference, but they have to tell us exactly what they did, why they believe in it, and how they think it works. And then we're going to debate whether we agree. You know, so this kind of educational opportunity is something, I, I think this is such a fantastic way of not closing off our ideas, remaining flexible and open to responses, uh, ways to adopt climate action, and recognizing that not all climate initiatives are good, but all of them are worth talking about. All of them are worth subjecting to insights. And if you wanted to, you know, this is just one of hundreds of articles that are out there right now on whether carbon offsets work or not. This particular article, you know, it, it goes through what a number of different experts have said. Some say it's a necessity. Some say it's greenwashing. So, you know, just that one news story like this can be a great conversation starter um, at your events. Um, all right, let's move now to the third step. So we've talked about um, number one and habit formation. We've talked about number two, which is about um, thinking about ways to actually communicate this change in very practical action-centered ways. Now we're gonna talk about the, the reality. Um, <laughs> the real, I mean, all that stuff is reality too, but we're gonna talk about what I call being real. You know, and this it comes, comes right back to my primary area of research, which is on how public relations firms and PR strategies sometimes uh, do the opposite of helping us think through climate action. In fact, they end up doing in various ways, a kind of climate denial or kind of, you know, muddying the waters about what is a good climate solution and what isn't. Um, some people call that greenwashing. Uh, when organizations try to appear more green or more environmentally friendly than they actually are. That's the basic definition. You know, a more the most charitable definition I can come up with for um, greenwashing is that organizations sometimes confuse sustainable communication with sustainable action. The key is to do both. You want to act sustainably and you want to communicate that action. But too often, I'm not saying anyone here, but too often organizations talk sustainability, but they don't walk sustainability. They can, and when they don't walk sustainability, they can really fall over. And this is really, really, really important because we know that trust in an organization comes from transparency. It comes from being straightforward, acknowledging what we are doing and what we could be doing, but we're not yet doing. Um, being transparent about how we do things and why. It takes us back to what I, I said a few moments ago, the how and the why of your climate actions are really, really important. Um, you know, right now, all over the world, this is from Europe, but this similar thing is happening in the US right now. Um, at the state level, at the federal level, um, and at municipal levels, the various 
government-led or nonprofit organizations are developing directives for organizations. You know, how can you know when you're greenwashing or when you're not? How do you make sure that what you're doing is uh, sustainable action and not just lip service? Because it isn't obvious. So I really encourage all of us to just, you know, to have this kind of booklet, which is prepared specifically for organizations like, like all of yours, to have this at the ready, um, have this kind of thing available so that you can think about what it means for your, for trust in your organization to practice sustainable uh, green action and what the flip side can look like. Knowing the flip side is just a, you know, a great way of not, not doing it, right? Setting the boundaries. These days, I would say, especially, um, you know, from my research, I, it's become clear that consumers or, you know, your stakeholders are very, very sensitive to green claims that are being made. Even if your path is paved with good intentions, they are going to check. They are going to want to know what's behind those green claims. You know, in the term greenwashing itself, I, I will say like, uh, you know, not more than three or four years ago, that term greenwashing was not a familiar term to most people. And today it is um, partly because of the media coverage of it, partly because of some of the high profile cases um, and, and uh, climate advocacy around fossil fuel companies and so on and their um, tremendous profits. You know, there's a lot of reasons. But the point is greenwashing is part of the common conversation now. And so you want to stay as far away from that as possible. Um, back in February, I had a really interesting conversation with a journalist about exactly this topic. Um, a journalist at NPR's name is Julia Simon. She had just started a new beat at NPR, uh, which is the Climate Solutions Desk. And as I, you saw in my earlier slides, I'm, you know, I'm always wary of the word solutions when it comes to climate action. And the great thing about this conversation with this journalist, Julia Simon, is that she, you know, she let it be a conversation. She also wanted to dig into, you know, what does it mean to be on the climate solutions desk as a journalist? You know, what does it mean to propose climate solutions? So we got this, into this great conversation of what a climate solution is and isn't. And I think um, Tristan or Kareem are going to put in the chat links to some of those stories. Those are short stories, but they're they're hopefully inspiring to you to just kind of think about, again, this kind of do's and don'ts when it comes to uh, climate solutions. And, you know, I want to come back to the fact that I know that all of you as communications professionals are, you know, you're the solutions people. <laughs> you're the people that I think a lot of other people in your organization are turning to, to find solutions. So, you know, I'm not saying you have to remove solutions from your vocabulary. The truth is we're all looking for solutions all the time. Um, you know, it's it's baked into your jobs, but I think it's baked into the way we are as human beings, too. You know, we want to find the ways to make things better. Um, and when climate change is incorporated into our mission, I think we can then perform that mission of looking for solutions in a climate change context, which involves this being real part that I'm, I'm talking about here. Um, this you know, when I, what I'm talking about with being honest or transparent, you know, saying what you are doing and what you aren't doing when it comes to climate action, you know, this is, a, that's a kind of radical honesty that I, I really believe in. Um, and that I think all, especially nonprofit organizations can adopt because, well, for one thing, we're communicating in a commercial environment where a lot of the for-profit companies that you're communicating alongside, excuse me, are not capable of doing. They a lot of for-profit companies don't practice radical honesty because of their for-profit obligations. We have a special role to play. We can cut through that kind of super promotional or hyper promotional communication by being honest. You know, it's easier. <laughs> I know it's you know easier said than done, but I I think it can be done. And I think relying on what we are doing, what we're not yet doing, what we want to be doing is is such an important refreshing way to communicate in your know, social media environments, in public environments, at events, and in all kinds of media environments. It doesn't mean, again, just sorry, I'm, maybe I'm repeating myself here, but I, I just really want to drive this point home. You don't have to have all the answers. What you want to convey to your stakeholders is that you're asking the right questions. That is what your stakeholders are going to be really, really inspired to hear and that you're going to keep asking those questions over time. You're not going to just do this once, say, yeah, okay, we've checked 
the sustainability box or we've checked the communications box. This is something you're committed to in the long haul. Along those lines, my fourth and final step toward climate action has to do with constantly finding sources of inspiration for yourself. And I won't spend too much time on this because I, I do want to leave some space for, for the Q&A, but I invite you to be inspired by some of the truly, truly habit-shifting initiatives that are starting to happen in our communities and to think about how you can incorporate some of this thinking into your own organization, either directly or indirectly. So here, you know, I teach in New Jersey, so this was really great and inspiring news for me uh, that New Jersey has become the first U.S. state to introduce a mandatory K-12 to climate change curriculum in their schools. And again, I think Tristan and Kareem are going to put in the chat, they have as you can see here, teaching resources and lesson plans and professional learning and all kinds of initiatives. And it's all open for everyone. Everyone can look through this stuff. Everyone can, can be inspired from these resources. Um, there's all kinds of ways this can help your organization too. The second one, this is I, you know very close to my heart. So I, I'm gonna uh, just take a minute here is that um, last week uh, I had the very, very great honor of speaking to the Junior Academy Model United Nations Conference uh, at Bergen Counties, New Jersey. And, you know, if you're worried about the next generation, I can tell you, you know, <laughs> based on this group, you no longer need to be worried. This was a really, really fantastic opportunity. Um, I spoke about um, climate change, of course, climate change communication. And I talked to these students about how some of the, some of the um, brands that they're so used to interacting with, you know, try to tell them that they're being climate friendly when they're not. Um, and I used the example of smart water, again, plastic bottles, as, as you know by now, this is my, my real you know, case I'm, I'm on everybody's case about. I talked about smart water and um, how its images appeared very climate friendly. They have this blue and white logo, you know, they, they have all these celebrities and this is how they try to make themselves seem authentic and cool. But the reality is, you know, sorry, here, are the, here are the, is the slide I showed them, you know, all of the ways that smart water brands itself. And, you know, here's the reality. The reality is this photo on the, the left you see here is from the Raritan and Passaic rivers in New Jersey. Um, which are incredibly polluted. Um, Rutgers researchers have found microplastics throughout the waterways. Um, you know, and I was saying to the students, why doesn't Smart Water do an ad like this? You know, and that, <laughs> they were like, oh, yeah, right. I, I get why. I get why they don't do that. So, you know, listening to the questions these students had to ask, seeing how quickly they got what I was trying to convey to them, understanding the connection between the consumption and the action in this case, which is that a lot of waste goes into these rivers um, and makes them totally, you know, I mean, no, I don't, not sure people would have wanted to swim in those rivers for, for a long time, but you know, this is, this is the reality um, of our uh, ability to do something and the reality that we're facing. So um, that's that. The last um, example I'm gonna leave you with, uh, which is just starting. So, uh, you know, I don't have any, secret insight here. This is from a New York Times article. What you see on the screen is a rendering, an architectural rendering of what Governor's Island is going to look like. Um, I think we're they're aiming for 2028 to actually have this thing up and up and running. Um, this is going to be a really interesting project to watch. It's going to be really, you know, a lot of accountability is going to have to be baked into the design, um, the transportation to and from this island. Um, the housing, the classrooms, and, and the kinds of climate action that um, this climate campus is going to be involved in. So I'm here at my conclusion, and, you know, I don't have a ton of things that I want to say here, except something that, you know, came up when I was talking with Sean and that, you know, really hit me. He showed you that Slack channel, and from the looks of it, um, you know, a lot of you are on Slack. Don't underestimate the power of your network when it comes to thinking through climate action. Um, what is your organization doing to function in a climate change era? Or what do you wanna be doing? Sharing best practices, sharing questions. Um, even if you're making modest habit changes, you should be telling everybody about them. You know, these are important and everyone is searching for ways to do this. And, uh, you know, maybe that seems really obvious to you, but it's it's not obvious enough to to researchers in the ways that we work together. We're just starting to find more and more ways to, co to collaborate on this stuff and work across disciplines. And I, I really hope 
that all of you can do this too, because now you have this shared result. Now you have this one thing, if only, you know, call network, the communications network is one thing that brings you all together. Climate change is another. So I really encourage you to use all of your um, Slack communications and other ways that you guys collaborate and connect to talk about climate change. Last slide for me, um, just, you know, pulling a couple of examples out of the, the new research on this topic. I'm going to share the PDFs for these academic articles, if anyone's looking for this kind of more in-depth dives or wants to see the research on this stuff. But, um, you know, we researchers are really starting to get our ducks in a row when it comes to thinking about integrating um, habits and behaviors with climate action. So um, anytime you need uh, some research on this stuff, you can come to me <laughs> and I'll share these PDFs as a way to get started. So um, that's everything for me. I think it's time for Q&A. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks again for your time. And thank you, Melissa. So I'm going to hop in here, gang, and we'll try to moderate this. We've got a few minutes here, and then we'll move over to office hours for those of you who've been with us before. And again, uh, we are going to get underway. I guess the easiest way to do this, gang, is you can either, we've got something in the Q&A already. Let's go in there. So Zoe's got a question. You all see that down at the bottom. It says Q&A, two thought bubbles. Type in your questions there, and I'll try to read them out. You can also, and this is worth knowing, you can vote for questions. So the ones that feel most relevant, give those a vote, and we'll use that as a way to determine who goes next. Zoe, our friend out in San Diego, her question is, and it's a mouthful, so let's see if I can get it out, spit it out here, is consumers are often made the scapegoats for climate change. We need to use pure, fewer plastic straws or print less when, the real, when, when in reality, industries are the major perpetrators of this issue. Creating impactful change will require more than not just using plastic bottles. We need to target the true issue. How do we ensure focusing on these minor changes and campaigns like Skip the Stuff doesn't perpetuate consumer scapegoatism? And how do we direct their narrative to these major players? That's such a great question. And I, I couldn't agree more with this perspective. It's the issue is not whether or not we recycle or whether or not we don't um, buy plastic bottles. The issue is that we are in fossil capitalism. <laughs> I'll just go ahead and say it and pull out all my research words here, my academic terms. We're in a lifestyle that appears to celebrate the ongoing use of fossil fuels as essential to our lifestyle. And you know, when I gave this talk last weekend to the Junior um, Model United Nations Academy, we talked about that because I, you know, when it's pointed out to us, we get that immediately, and we realize that it's not the case. So, I what I've tried to do lately with with some a step like this is. I use these small consumer oriented actions to remind us in a daily way that we do not need that fossil fuel fueled lifestyle. We don't require it. And every time we go into a store and don't make a purchase or every time we communicate about these climate commu commitments, we can emphasize exactly what Zoe's saying in this question. We can say, we know this isn't enough. We know that the real perpetrators are these, you know, carbon majors, these fossil fuel majors. You know, we know, and constantly beating that drum has an impact. It does affect people. It makes us think twice. It makes, you know, with my students, they realized that there's a real pulling the wool over your eyes thing that's happening by some of these big companies. And they saw through it as soon as I helped them make that connection. It was almost like they felt like they weren't allowed to make the connection between say a smart water ad and getting smart water and the larger impact that it has. As soon as they were given the permission to make that connection, then they were all about talking about ways to overcome it. I had a student asking me about investments. <laughs> I was like, do you have investments yet? You know, this grade eight student saying, isn't there a way that people can pull their investments from, you know, companies that invest in climate change? You know, the, I was getting such great questions. So the more we make the connection, but you're right, without scapegoating, without making it feel like it's on us to make the change, you know, we're doing one thing, but there's at much higher levels, a lot more needs to happen. So continuing to um, show up, you know, continuing to vote, I can't say it enough times, continuing to enforce plastic bans. Um, there are some coming down the pike uh, in various states. We've seen plastic bag bans. There are more single use plastic bans coming down the pike. Signing those petitions to the extent your organization, you know, is able to do that kind of thing. Showing up for those events. 
it goes a really long way. There are a couple more questions in here. Keep them coming, gang. Our friend Lois has a question. And then, you know, I don't like this gang. An anonymous <laughs> attendee put in a question. I'm going to go ahead and read it because someone voted for it. But generally, put your name behind stuff, gang. Uh, how do you suggest communicating to an audience who feels helpless against the whims of the fossil capitalist machine? Right. So hopefully as that person was typing, yeah. I was kind of addressing some of those questions. You're, I mean, but I will stress this is this is really important because when we feel overwhelmed, sometimes our reaction is to shut down, is to just say it's just too big. Like, and you know, like Zoe said, what difference is it going to make if I buy Gatorade or not today? Really, you know, and the, <laughs> the answer in the short term is you're right, it's not going to make a difference. It's just not. But in the longer term and in a scalable way we are making a difference. I, I I used to not really believe in that. I used to think that, you know, the incremental stuff wasn't even worth focusing on. And I've really changed my tune in the last couple of years. I think every time we say or do something about climate change, we are contributing to making climate change a de facto part of our lives. And this comes back to what I said at the beginning, we're communicating in a climate era. So acknowledging that and bringing that forward is actually a really important way to overcome that helplessness. And the truth is like, I, I'm not really sure how to articulate this, like we get the sense that we're pushing against this fossil capitalist machine, but the machine is already breaking down. It's breaking down right now. We see it, we see it in the desperation of their communications. We see it in some of the very underhanded tactics and we see it in all of the climate litigation that's now starting to come forward, that's really amping up. It is breaking down and what we are doing is working. And we cannot let all of the commercials on TV and all of the campaigns detract or distract us from that recognition, that reality. Probably also worth, I would just add, the organizations represented in this webinar and who are part of the network, as I think y'all know, there've been tons of studies looking at sort of the stature and standing of different institutions and as we all know generally speaking including our own in our sector are declining but social sector organizations foundations and nonprofits are still more trusted more appreciated more celebrated by the average person out in the public than many other whether it's industry or government or what have you and the opportunities in front of you and i think what what if i could put words in your mouth melissa the responsibilities that sit with everyone in this audience are extraordinary because it really is about to your point lots of habits add up aggregate over time and the actors who are making those habits who are taking those actions right it matters when the metropolitan museum of art takes a climate forward approach in everything that they do particularly how they articulate it right how they speak about it, how they communicate it, and weave that into everything that they do it's a cultural piece, but I don't. I'm putting words in yeah. No, no, but I, 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 I mean, no. I I agree one thousand percent, and I'll just add to that by saying that we nonprofit organizations, everyone here on this call, is operating in the public interest, and that is so powerful. And the, we know it's powerful because for the last four decades, fossil fuel companies have pretended that they too are operating in the public interest because operating in the public interest is what we all care about. It's part of our, our democratic ideal. And the more we show that those companies are not operating in the public interest and that we are, the, the more powerful our communications will be. Yeah, let's get back to questions. Next one comes from our friend Lois in what I hope is a very lovely day up in New Hampshire. One thing that is a challenge is to assess the climate impacts of different actions. For instance, when people in an organization all work from home, it would seem that there'd be an overall climate benefit to keeping those cars off the road instead of commuting to an office. But what about the energy, particularly like heating or cooling that people are using now sitting alone in houses and working? What is actually worse uh, or what is actually worse and how could we figure that out? Right. And, you know, I have a colleague who does research on computing power and how that contributes to um, climate change. And, you know, then now what do you do? <laughs> if you're, you know, you can't use your computer anymore, you know. And, you know, unfortunately, again, fossil fuel companies will really try to um, take advantage of the of these fears, and these concerns that that Lois is raising. You know, you think you're being so climate friendly, but really, you know, you're adding. Um, so how do we do this? There are, you know, it's. It's very hard because it's hard to make these things commensurable, right? It's hard to show how 
staying home, you know, in a deliberate way is actually better than coming into the office and, and so on. So that, you know, that kind of thing is tricky. And there are there are some organizations I, I can share these um, with uh, with Comnet for to get distributed out. There are some, um, you know, apps and various types of metrics that are trying to do this kind of accounting that are trying to, you know, like carbon footprinting. We, we know about this kind of thing. Right. So it's like you can actually calculate if you take a flight how much you're contributing, how much your carbon footprint is and stuff like that. That stuff is out there. You know, the worry about it is that, you know, the metrics are not um, standardized. So, you know, my version of carbon metrics and your version of carbon metrics might not go together. And then I'm going to get two totally different sets of answers. And then suddenly there's that fear we have of, of not being real, right? That it, just that it inserts a kind of level of distrust. Like, how do you trust those numbers? One of the things I talked about in my last um, webinar, which I'll, I'm going to import here because I think it's relevant, is that it's a, my sense from Lois's um, question is that her audiences or stakeholders or her organization needs to show a measurable change, right? Not all organizations work that way. Some are able to tell compelling stories and have that be solid enough evidence. But other organizations, for a variety of reasons, might be the kind of work they do, uh, might be just the way they operate. They, they need the numbers, they need the statistics, right? They You, you got to actually show some hard evidence. So what I suggest there is taking some of the, you know, now there are dozens of really inviolable climate reports, you know, the IPCC report, <laughs> take those numbers, right? Take their evidence, take some United Nations evidence of the difference between adopting, you know, heating or cooling um, measures for your home and having those in the office or having a campaign where, you know, I, I was just reading this actually yesterday on some other website. I'm reading this stuff constantly. Sealing your, the doors and windows apparently is a massive way to protect um, and lower, you know, lower energy costs and, and prevent energy waste. So have a campaign where everyone at your house, you know, you have a day and everyone's taking pictures of themselves sealing up their windows and doors and sending that and using that as climate communication. You know, so you take the existing statistics numbers, you know, again, very, very um, fact-based and deeply researched information out there. And you um, use that information to develop a campaign that your organization can do and pointing to those numbers is a real way to, to be transparent and straightforward with your communications. And I want to be mindful of time, but it seems to me maybe this is a good place to talk a little bit about something we talked about last time that you and I have talked about privately, which is this idea of greenwashing. Mm -hmm. Because as much as we might want to encourage people to think we all live in a climate change era, it is incumbent upon all of us to think about what are our responsibilities and what are our roles, particularly the privileged roles we sit in and these, these jobs that we have in this sector. What's the danger that we could run into with regard to greenwashing? Because I know this is something that's a particularly sticky wicket for you. Mm -hmm. The danger is that your stakeholders have less trust in what you have to say. And, you know, as you, I'm sure, again, you all know this, we, as consumers of information, you know, we're bombarded with information at all times, and we use a lot of shortcuts, cognitive shortcuts to make sense of something. So we're not going to look at your brand and, you know, separate it out into silos, like, oh, well, I don't, really think what they're doing on climate, I, I don't really get that, but I like them in this way. You know, we're going to just actually blanket decide that the brand is trustworthy or not trustworthy, right? We're not going to split that up. So if you're greenwashing, and even inadvertently, this is why I said, you know, it's paved with good intentions sometimes, you know, if you're saying something like, we believe in the sustainable development goals put forward by the United Nations, right? That's empty. That's just empty. That doesn't show me that you're actually doing anything, right? Or, or you know, there's a whole other conversation we can have about those sustainable development goals. I remember Sean and I chatting about this. But, you know, believing in something and doing something concrete that actually gets you all fired up and that connects your brand to climate action is going to go so much farther than making these kind of broad goodwill statements that is just not going to have that impact. That's to me, you know, because I, I think we're in a crowd where I'm not worried about the kind of greenwashing that Exxon is doing. <laughs> you know, it's a very different kind of story here. Here, I'm just worried about having good intentions, wanting to show that your values are aligned with climate change, but not doing the kind of, you know, down to the ground work 
um, that that can allow you to actually speak about climate change. It's so much more impactful to speak about even a small thing that you're doing than to try to make these big statements that you can't really show any evidence for in your organization. Oops, I think you're uh, muted there, Sean. Right, I should know better by now. Well, we're up at the top of the hour. Let's let's do one more thing, then we'll take everybody over to the office hours, and that is uh, very very briefly. Just go back to the audit from a communications perspective. What where does the power sit inside of a communication shop? What kind of an audit could they do? What are some things that might be modest to your point, modest but meaningful that mm -hmm. comm shops have in their purview within their power to make changes? Oh boy. Well, it, you know, and I, I realize um, this is just kind of anecdotal yeah, off the top of your yeah, head. No. Just give us a couple things that you could sort of think about. I know you pointed to the yeah, thing of the board yeah. book that we talked about. Right. Um, gosh, I, you know, I'm not enough of an expert on things like, you know, paper reduction and recycling and stuff like that to be able to say, you know, confidently do this or don't do that. Um, I, how, how would I put this? Like, Okay, well, you know what? I'll give one example. I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit less uh, high minded here. I'm gonna give a quick example that my colleague shared with me, um, which is the outside of your office, the green space. Hopefully, you have some that's out of your office. If indeed people are coming to the office, apparently, mowing the lawn is really not good for the climate. It's you know that's like the most minor thing, but it's like, are are you able to to like communicate with the people who run the, your building and have like native plants out there or just not mow the lawn. I mean, the easiest thing of all, just not mow the lawn. It's surprising how good that is for the environment to just let stuff grow. <laughs> so, you know, that's again, possibly a mundane example, possibly irrelevant, you know, depending on where you work. But it's little things like that, that allow a conversation to happen around it and allow larger ideas to flower, pun intended. <laughs> but Sorry, I think you're muted one more time there, Sean. I did it again. Yeah. All right. So we've got a bunch of questions popping in here. Here's what I'm going to say, gang. We will take all of them, but not here and not right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to invite y'all. We'll put into the chat a link. We'll go to office hours so we can all be in conversation. Say thank you to Marva uh, for kindly guiding us over the course of this last hour by offering thank ASL you. services. Uh, thank you to everybody for making some time. And those who can, you're welcome. We'll see you over in office hours. Fire up your cameras and we'll chit chat as a group. All right. See you soon. Thank